All right, we're back. We're on problem number seven, listing all the prime numbers from one to 1,000. Okay, uh, yeah, this is a fun problem. To be honest, I haven't solved this problem in a while. So maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. We're going to talk it through. You know, sometimes it's, I've been kind of making these videos all day long. I'm a little foggy. Uh, that's okay. This will be more about talking about the process of thinking out the solution. We might uh, make some missteps along the way. So remember, a prime number can be divided by itself and one and no other numbers in terms of uh, not having a remainder. So if we want to find all the prime numbers from one to 1,000, how could we do that? Um, here's a way we could think about doing it. We know how to make the first, we know how to make the numbers from one to 1,000. We could put that in a variable just like this. So there we go. We've got an A, it's got 1,000 numbers in it. Basically, we know we've got our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right, and on and on. The algorithm here is something like this. We're gonna go to the first number and we're gonna ask a question. Is this a prime? Yep, check. Is, then we go to the next number. Is this a prime? Yep. And how about the next? And we're gonna we're gonna basically apply this question to each of these numbers, and we're gonna do that for the one to one thousand, right? And then we're gonna check. So uh, number four, is it prime? No, it can be divided by two, so it's not a prime. How about five? Yep, it's prime. How about six? No, it can be divided by three and two. So nope. What about seven? Yep. What about eight? Nope. Four and two. So we're kind of just mentally doing this algorithm. But we've suggested a method. If we had a function, some kind of function, that could be a prime tester, it could return true for prime numbers, it could return false for numbers that aren't prime numbers, um, we would have a pretty good way to do this. Because we could write a little loop, that'd be something like for i in a, If is prime i equals true, print i. You know, if, if we could do something like this, like if we actually had a function that could determine whether the number is prime, then we could just do this. And it would print out all the numbers whenever, whenever, the, whenever they're prime according to this function. So what we need to do is write this function. This is a way of thinking about the problem. We don't necessarily know how to write this function yet, but we know that we do need to write it. Okay. Um, before we get there, uh, this is somewhat related to the previous problem of knowing whether a number is odd or not. I'm just gonna quickly show the logic of this approach uh, but for odd numbers. So I'll just make a little detour here. Oops, undo that. And, oh, list all the prime numbers from one to 1,000. Okay, there we go. So I'm just going to do a slightly different thing. to show the general logic of this kind of organization. So we're gonna have the numbers one to 100 in A. We're gonna try to go through each of them and ask if the number's odd or not, and then print it if it's true. So first of all, we need to write this is odd function. And to do that, we need an input. And well, we could say if x mod two equals one, then return true. Let's see how this kind of function would work. So is odd, now let's put a one in there. 
returns true. Let's put a two in there. It doesn't return true. Actually, we should have it return false. How about that? So I'm just writing this slightly differently. Um, and this is a prettier way to, to do it. Oh, OK. Here we go. OK. So if x odd 2 equals 1, that means there is a remainder, print true. And if not, print false. So let's try this. And notice we're not using the word return in here. This is sort of assumed, so it should still work. So one, two, three, four, right? Uh, so this is kind of a function that checks if something is true about the input value. Now that we have this function working, uh, when we, I'm just gonna space this out so it's easier to read, in this little loop where we go through each of the values of A, we check whether the current value of I is odd, and if it is true, that it is odd, then we'll print it. So if we do this, we print all the numbers that are odd. Great. So I want to do this basic logic for the problem. So we need to create a variable from 1 to 1,000. We need to create a function that checks if something's a prime number. And then we could just print them all off, and we'd be done. Cool. So we've got our values 1 to 1,000. We need to make a prime checker. I'm going to put it up here because we need to define the function before we use it. And I'm going to get into a habit right now, which I've been sort of doing inconsistently. And this is called using snake case. OK. Snake case. And the idea of snake case is uh, to separate words with an underscore. And it helps, I think, make variable names readable. So I didn't do it here. Is odd. Well, let's do it. Let's make it an underscore so that we can more easily read it. So I'll reload that, and there we go. Notice uh, the old one's still in there. So I'm just going to remove it using the rm function. And we will add the underscore is prime here. I don't think there's a function already called is prime, is there? Nope. Okay, so how are we gonna find out if a number is prime or not? Well, we're gonna have to take a number in, so we'll take that as an x. So our input parameter is an x. And what do we wanna do? How do we test a number to see if it's a prime number? One of the reasons this is an interesting problem is because there's lots of different ways to do this, and some of them are way more efficient than other ways. So there's some computationally expensive ways that can take a long time, especially when the numbers get big. But let's talk about a kind of exhaustive way to do it that is maybe the most straightforward. So let's pick a number. I'm, I'm just going to pick the number uh, 11. OK, 11. And uh, when, we asking a question, when we're asking a question about prime numbers, we're asking if there's any numbers between 1 and the current number, between 1 and 11, that can divide evenly into this number. So that means we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, right? And for any number here, we would have all the numbers before it. And if we really wanted to know <laughs> if a number was prime, we would have to show the following. We would have to go to the first number and say, can this number divide by 11? Well, the first number is always going to be 1. And that's going to be a check. We know that when we get to the last number, uh, we'll always divide it into itself evenly. So that's going to be a check. The question is about all the numbers in the middle. So let's check a 2. Uh, can you divide 
11 by 2 evenly? No. I mean, you could try it out. It doesn't work. How about a 3? Nope. How about a 4? Nope. I mean, we could go on, but I'm going to tell you right now. None of these numbers divide evenly into 11. So let's take a look at what we're seeing here. Uh, we see that in terms of our checks, we've done, and we've done 11 checks, right? A prime number is one, if it's been checked all the way through from the first to the last number, it's going to return two check marks. Or we could call these trues and all these other ones falses. Right? So it's going to have two trues, any prime number, if we, if we checked every single number. So this is one way to think about how we could write this function. Like we could basically say, well, the first thing we need to do is generate the sequence that we need to check, right? And that sequence is going to be from one to X. In our case, it was 11. So we needed to make this series of numbers in order to check it. And if we do this part, let's just quickly see, is prime 11? Now, we don't see anything happening here. I'm just going to return what we've made so far so we could see it, right? We'll redo the function. And we're gonna say, is prime 11? So the only thing we've done is we've generated the numbers one to 11 and we're returning that. Well, what we need to do now is go in there and check each of the numbers to find out if it divides evenly into 11. So what does that mean? Well, we're basically talking about going like this. Um, 11, um, one second. Right, we, we want to go and use the uh, modulus function again because we want to start at the first number, be something like 11 mod 1, and see if there's a remainder. There's zero remainder. Then we go to the second number, see if there's a remainder. The third number, go see if there's a remainder. Fourth number, see if there's a remainder. Fifth number, see if there's a remainder. All of these are non zero, so there's always a remainder. Let's keep track. What we're going to do is go for uh, I in generate sequence. Right, so it's going to we're going to go through each of the values in generate sequence one, two, three, four, five, and if I mod, oops, sorry it wrong if it'll if hmm. got to think about the function here I was gonna say if 11 mod I but it's actually going to be X mod I equals zero now what am I doing what am I about to do what I'm about to do is say if the uh, so X is remember it's the final value in this case 11 if our X was going to be 11, is the final value mod whatever current value we're on, uh, does that equal zero? If it does, uh, let's increment a count. Let's uh, create a prime counter. Or let's just call it a counter. That's easy. So we're going to start a counter at zero. And every time this happens, uh, where one of the values divides evenly by the big value, we're going to add a value to our counter. So we're going to do it like this. We're going to say our value of counter is going to be itself, which starts at zero, and it's going to increment by one. So every time we go through one of these check marks, it's going to go up by one. Then let's just stop here. And let's do return counter and see where we're at. So we're going to run this 
and let's go is prime 11. So we get a two, that's great. How about is prime 10? Well, we get four, right? Because if we were dividing by 10, uh, 10 gets divided by itself. That's a one, five, and a two, and a one. So there's four values that divide into 10 evenly. So that count should be a four, just like it is. So it looks like our counter is working. Uh, but what we want to know is not what the count actually is. We want to know if the number is prime or not. So the number will be prime when the count is a two. So after we've done all the counting, let's say if counter equals two, we can return true else we return false. Okay, this should work. Let's check it out. So we know that a one is a prime. Oh, actually, this is funny. It's not gonna work for every single case. Uh, but let's try some that it does. That, that we, so we know that 11 is a prime. So is it gonna work? Is prime 11? It says it's true, it says it is a prime. Great, how about 10? It's not a prime, and we know that. How about a nine? Not a prime, should it say false? How about an eight? How about a seven? True, good. How about a six? How about a five? It's working. Let's go down to two. It works. How about one? It returns false. And that's because there's only one number there. It could never get to two. So another way of saying this is, and I think it would leave us with the same logic. Uh, if our counter is two or less than two, because if you have a one, you could divide only by one number. So let's change this requirement to not equals to, but less than or equals to two. And now we should do is prime one and we'll get that value being true. Cool. So if we now go run this function, uh, we remember we've got our variable a that's got the numbers one to 1000 up here and we're going to apply this is prime function to each of those values. And if it's true, we're gonna print the value. So let's do it. Check them out. So we got one, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, and so on. We should be able to check any one of these. And I, I'm just scrolling through and looking at them and I'm seeing for example, there's no even numbers, that's good. And apparently all of these are prime numbers. Pretty cool. Well, I'm skeptical, 499, does that divide by three? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. We could do a bunch of other things at this point. Um, you know, I haven't sat down and verified any other way uh, that the numbers between, uh, which numbers between one and 1,000 are actually prime numbers. I could probably go find a list of them that someone else you know, was an expert on and said, these are definitely prime numbers. I could then compare my first thousand to that list and make sure that they're all the same, not missing any. Uh, and let me pause for a second. All right, there's, many ways to go from here just to like stay on this prime function thing and talk about various things around this function. For, first of all, this is a really inefficient function and we could shorten it. Uh, there's no good reason why we need to actually check every single number. Uh, for example, if our number, let's say it was 10, it's an even number. It's not a prime number. 
except for two and uh, any even number can't be a prime number. So we should not be checking any even numbers. We just get rid of them. So there's, there's ways to uh, get rid of numbers that we don't need to check that would make this function faster. But uh, we have a working function. Let's just leave it like that for now. I'm going to talk about adding a bit more information in terms of reporting from this function. So currently, uh, what happens is the isPrime function, oh, actually, I'm gonna do this, and do, what, what does the isPrime, is prime, what it does is returns a true statement, true or false, and that's great. We put it in this little loop to apply this uh, function to each of the elements, um, and then we, uh, in, in A, which has the numbers 1 to 1,000, and then we printed the value. Um, I want to, what do I want to do? Right, this is what I want to do. Sorry about that. I want to illustrate how uh, we can expand on things to increase elements that we might be interested in saving when, when we're doing these kinds of problems. So here, uh, what if we wanted not just a list of the prime numbers from one to 1,000, imagine a table and let's just write it over here. Imagine we had a table and it was gonna be number, it goes one, two, three, all the way to a thousand. And count, this is the number of numbers that divide evenly into these numbers. So the count here would be one, the count here would be two, the count here would be two, for four, the count here would be four, two, and one, for three, for five would be uh, two, and so on. That, that's that number we were evaluating. And then we could have a prime, so it would be true, 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 false, true. Imagine a table like this that gave us all the information um, that you know we could use uh, and have it all in one table. The way we've set up our uh, function is it just produces one of these true or false values for a particular number, and it wouldn't make this whole table for us. But uh, we could rewrite this in order to create such a table. And I'm going through this example because down the line in data analysis, uh, there'll be many times when you want to grow a table, create a table, um, or save particular values as a result of pr particular simulations you might be running. Um, so I'm just gonna give a quick example of doing that. We've already solved the problem, but here we're just going to make sure we uh, add a little bit more information to our results. And I'm going to create a B version of this function. So I've just copied the original one. I've run this line, so we've got is prime B. And now the question is, what am I going to return when I, uh, as an output for this function? Right now it's just true or false, depending on if the count is less than two. Okay. Let's return the number, the count, and whether it's prime or not. And this kind of information is, let's see, the number here, the current number will be sorry, whatever x is, the count, that will be the counter value at the end of the loop, 
and the prime value. Well, we're sort of doing that right here, but let's be a little bit more formal and say uh, prime. So if counter is less than two, we're going to say prime, oops, we're gonna, we're gonna assign the value of true to this prime variable, so there we go. And if it is not less than two, less than or equal to two, we're gonna assign a value of false to this prime variable. All right, now what I'd like to be able to do is output these three different pieces of information. And there's one problem I can already anticipate, and that is we've got a number, a number, and a logical value. And let me just see if we can do something like with our I'm going to make a test variable. And I'm going to say, well, let's let's try to store this first thing here. Let's try it out. How would you do that? Combine one comma one comma t. It worked, but it turned the t into a one. What if we put an f there? It worked, and it turned the t or it turned the f into a zero uh, because those logical values of true or false are interchangeable with ones and zeros. So that did work, and that's, that's fine. Um, okay, let's roll with it. I'm thinking in the background here about the, the conversions that I'll have to do later on in order to get this table back in terms of two columns of numbers and one column of true and false statements. And uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but definitely we can convert between various formats. Let's try something simple here, and let's just try returning uh, a combined vector that contains the number, which is x, comma, the counter, comma, the prime. All right, let's see what happens when we do this is underscore prime underscore b. Oops, I didn't write the function that it printed it out for me. And now we do 11. And we're now getting an, uh, a return output that has more information. So we've got a number 11 that count for it two, and whether it's prime or not. So one means it is and zero means it isn't. If we did 10, we get 10, 4, and 0. So we're, we've written a function that creates these uh, whole rows of information for a given input. And let's say I wanted to build a data frame that had all of this information. Um, oh. I gotta think if I can just write it. Let's try this. We're gonna create something called prime table and we're gonna call it a data frame. And it's gonna be empty and have nothing in it. So it has zero observations of zero variables. We're gonna go through each of the numbers in one to 1000. We're gonna run the is prime function uh, however, we're going to have a little problem here because when we run this function, uh, it's going to return three values. So in fact, we want to evaluate the third value, right? The third one here, not the first, second, the third one. And ask if it's true or false, but actually we want to ask if it's one or zero. We want it to be a one. So we've got to change a few of these things. Um, and actually, what am I saying? Um, sorry, 
and kind of got lost on what I was doing here. I'm just going to delete all of this. <laughs> all right. And what we want to do now is just apply the function is underscore prime to the value i. And let's see what happens if we do this. Um, oops. The function is now called is prime underscore b. We need to print it to see what happens. There we go. Okay, so it did kind of print everything, but uh, it didn't save it in a variable. What I'd like to do is show you a command. We'll get more into data frames later. This is sort of just seeing an example of creating a data frame a particular way. And we're going to take the data frame prime table, and we're going to do something called a row bind. We're going to bind to the next row some information. So R bind prime table. What we're doing here is we're binding a new row to the bottom of this data frame. This data frame currently has nothing in it. Let's see if this will work. Check out this table. All right, so we've got in our first column the numbers 1 to 1,000. In our second column, we've got the counts. And in our third column, we've got prime values. Now, we also have these x1, x1.1, x1.2. These aren't very good names for these columns. And I'll just point out now that lots of things you have to do in R are be, being mindful of uh, naming conventions and organization. So let's see if I can quickly look at the names of this data frame. We're getting x1, x1.1, x1.2. And I happen to know a quick way to replace those names would be to send in or assign in a vector with three names in it. So for example, number, count, and prime. If we did something like that, when we go back here, we've changed the names. And now we've made this nice little data frame that we were looking for. All right. Uh, the reason I went through this example to create this data frame that contains all this information is that uh, this is a common operation we'll see in statistical analysis all the time in R. That is, we'll be doing some kind of pre-processing on real data in order to create a data frame that has this kind of structure. And once we have a data frame with this kind of structure, we then get to use some incredible tools that, uh, well, there's lots of ways, lots of tools. Uh, we'll probably focus on the tidyverse tools. And uh, these tools allow us to quickly manipulate data frames in important ways. So for example, if we have this data frame and it tells us in one column uh, which numbers are true primes, you know, what we want to do is basically, well, let's just take all the rows with a T in them and then look at the numbers. How we, so we want to filter this for the rows with Ts and then just select the numbers that meet those criteria. And we can say that in English. And how do you do it in R? Well, there's uh, a number of ways to accomplish that algorithmic goal. I'll just quickly show you a tidyverse method. And you'll need to use the DPLYR package. If you haven't installed this already, go to Packages, Install, DPLYR. There it is, dplyr, and click Install. This is the first time I've used a library, I think. So I'm just going to load it. And this is just a quick example. Of course, uh, 
we're going way ahead here actually, but I'm just giving you a taste of a tidy burst style. You define the name of your data frame, and then we use something called the pipe operator. It looks like this, percent greater than percent. And we're basically sending this data frame into a pipeline of operations. So the first thing we want to do to this data frame is filter it. And we get to give the name of a column. So we've got the prime column. And we basically want to filter it and s keep all the rows with a one. So if we go prime equals one, let's just see what happens. What we get is all of the ones with a one stay. So we're filtering on one, keeping the ones. Um, we can now see right here that, yep, these are all the prime values in the number column. And if I wanted to select just that column, we could add another section uh, to this series of pipe operators, and we could use the select function, and we could select the number column. When we do that, we just get down to this one column of prime numbers. We'll be learning a lot about this style of analysis that involves creating a data frame and then filtering it and selecting it uh, to accomplish various transformation goals before some kind of analysis. All right, I think I'm gonna end this prime example here. Uh, I might come back to this prime example later because there's so many different ways we could actually write the prime function and considering these alternative ways uh, is an interesting exercise for thinking about how our code can look and what your options are for accomplishing these kinds of goals. But this is it for now.